Welcome back to Call Time with Katie Bierenbaum. I'm so excited to be back after a very refreshing week off. As always, please let me know in the comments if you have any ideas or requests for shows to focus on for my special episodes or even guests. But um, beyond your recommendations, which I always appreciate, I think you're going to be really excited by my next round of guests upcoming, especially because I'm kicking things off with a truly fantastic actress, singer, dancer, a former Alphaba, the first on the show, which is literally making me scream inside. Those of you who watch often know that I'm a big Wicked fan. I'm right in the demographics. So um, without further ado, the wonderful Teal Wicks. Welcome. Ooh, hello. Hello. Hi. Oh, I am so honored to be the first Alphaba because it is a long legacy of really fantastic ladies. So that's hopefully the first of many. Maybe I'll have all the Alphabas at some point. It's oh my a, gosh, yeah. <gasps> That'd be amazing. Or like Goals. a round table, Goals. perhaps a um a round table discussion of Alphabas. Oh yes, yes. They do that in the te- then like the television film world all the time. The round table panels yes, with all the like on yeah. actresses, this would just be mm-hmm. Alphabas on Alphabas. <laughs> Alphabas on Alphabas. <laughs> But before we get chatting, I want to introduce my guest for those of you who may not be familiar, though I expect many of you are familiar. Teal grew up in Sacramento, California before earning her degree in drama and musical theater from UC Irvine. Not long after graduating, Teal played Alphaba in the Los Angeles run of Wicked. She went on to play the role in the San Francisco production and finally on Broadway where she starred opposite Katie Rose Clark for seven months. Her Broadway career took off from there. She's since starred in the revival of Jekyll and Hyde, Finding Neverland, and most recently as sort of the middle version of Cher known as Lady in the Cher show. Mm -hmm. And because she's a pro, she's also of course starred in many regional and off-Broadway productions as well and done TV and film. Is there, are there any glaring, did I miss anything? No, no, you make me sound so successful. Good job, Teal. I love to start at the beginning with my guests, but, and I I sort of ask everyone the same thing at the beginning, but before I do that, I have a question unique to you that I've been dying Uh to know since I even Uh heard of you before I knew you, and that is, where does the name Teal come from? Oh, yeah, Um, I know. I really, really like my name. Thankfully, my parents... Uh, have been <laughs> I always say if my parents were ever had any like trepidations about me pursuing a career as a performer and all of that I was like you should have given me a less interesting name um, because when I was really little I thought for the longest time that I was the only teal in the world so that kind of just instilled with me a, a bit of like <laughs> an innate sort of confidence and feeling unique in the yeah. world which is always helpful when you're trying to be a uh, actor because the only thing that you can control is who you are and what makes you great is 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 because you're unique to only you anyways um but yeah so so teal actually i mean it's a color and it's a nice color um and my mom really liked that color um i don't know it was like it was the 80s and teal was very very popular in the palettes in the wardrobe palettes um of the 80s and into the 90s so I fit in very well uh, uh, but actually the main idea of, of the name teal came from there are ducks teal ducks they're very they're a very very pretty small duck that's very common in North America and my dad's dad my grandfather he was a big hunter and he was a big duck hunter and so like my grandparents house was just full of duck paraphernalia and just teal ducks kind of my dad was like those those are really pretty ducks and I really like that name and he mentioned it to my mom and she's like I love that color I love that name and it's a stuck so I love that and I'm I'm very happy to know that well I mean I'm sure this would be great too but I'm I love that it's your actual name and not just like a name you picked out for when you joined equity yeah yeah I know a lot of people do not believe that it's my real name but it is. And everybody thinks they're like, oh my gosh, your parents are probably hippies because I come from, you know, California, like Northern California. I was like, not really. I don't know. They just felt like getting creative. (laughs) I I also feel like not only did it spell your future success as an actor, but because you're a beautiful redhead, I was admiring your hair earlier. Like teal is the ultimate color for redheads to wear, I feel. 
It is. Um, here, well, this isn't so much a secret, but I'm actually not naturally a redhead. I'm more, more blonde, but my mom's side of the family, my mom comes from an Irish family. And so, and she had 10 siblings and their hair ran the full gamut of like all Irish hair colors that you could have from like super duper blonde. My mom was more on the blonde to like, like the dark auburn. So I just embraced my family roots. Um, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Normally I actually have more red hair, but I have to yeah. to the hair salon. I always identified inside as a redhead and I was more red as a kid, as I'm sure yeah. you were as well. Yeah. I was like strawberry blonde. Um, yeah. And it's, I, I experimented with my hair all the time. Like I said, like I was, a, I was a teenager in the nineties. So it was like pink, green, blue hair, oh, wow. um, stripes. <laughs> bleach blonde because every you know wanted to have like Gwen Stefani's bleach blonde hair and all of right. that when I was post college and doing a show because anyways I was like ah, I'm gonna play with my hair because I'm in a show for a little bit and I wear a wig and I went dark because I had never had like dark hair and when it faded it like a red au auburn sort of stuck around and then I just slowly embraced more of the red and then it just stuck well I think of it as like your signature now like before yeah. I met you I think of you as like beautiful redhead actor like that's how I would describe you yeah it feels very me so it's good. it took me you know 25 years or something to fully embrace my the hair I should have always had so Journey. speaking of your childhood this is the question that I do ask many people oh. when they come on the show is there a moment that you can think of that you from your childhood or adolescence when you had some experience that was like oh, theater is it. This is, this is for me. This is what I want to do with my life. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, I, I loved music, like music always. My parents loved music. My, my grandmother was a, had been a choir teacher, piano teacher. So she, she had a piano at her house and we would always, she'd always play and all the grandkids we would sing. And it was just a whole thing. Um, so music was just always around and I just loved it. And I would be, I would sing all the time. Uh, and I was kind of shy, but like, as soon as I would start singing, I would sort of lose that shyness. Um, and there's two things. So the movie Annie changed the everything. 80s version, was, I assume. The 80s version. I mean, Bernadette Peters and, oh, and yes. um, um, Tim, Tim Curry. <laughs> See, cause I'm and, a child of the nineties version which is Kristen uh -huh. Chenoweth, Alan Cumming, Audrey uh -huh. McDonald. Oh, yes. Victor Garber. Right. Oh my gosh, yeah. Different Annie's, different redheads, different, different Annie's. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think mine was the best, but that's also. We can, we can have a separate round mm. table about that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that was amazing. So I was like, young people, to, like the song, I was obsessed with a song tomorrow. I would sing it ev and everywhere everywhere it was the first song I knew by heart and I would just belt it out and I just loved everything about it and I was like oh my gosh this is amazing and and I somehow at some point I guess kind of knew that it was a musical I mean I knew it was a musical but like there were stage versions of it um and that's when it was sort of like musicals like singing and acting and dancing in this world that's so cool how do you do that and then my parents took me to a lot of theater. Growing up in Sacramento, there's a big art scene, like a like local art scene. And then we also get the um, the touring shows that come through. And uh, Kathy Rigby's Peter Pan came through. And I remember that when I saw that in the theater, I just, everything about it just made me like, just fall in love. And I, and I really, I could understand that this was distinctly theater there was something about being in this theater with these people performing live in front of us with a live orchestra there and like she's flying uh the kids are flying there I love I love Neverland I loved Peter Pan I loved like fantasy stuff and all of that so that element with just the great music and the freaking flying like she's tumbling in the air and just the like suspension of disbelief and the fact that I, I knew these were real people doing amazing things in front of me, but how it could just, I would transport me into this world of Neverland. I somehow was able to put that together and knew that it was distinctly theater. And so I was like, I want to do that. I want to be on stage. I want to be with those people 
like running amok. I want to be a lost boy. I want to just do all of that. So, and we would go to a lot of the shows and I just loved being in a theater. Like we went to the ballet, the Sacramento ballet is at the same place where the touring shows would go to. So we went to the same theater a lot. And I just, I loved being in the theater. I loved being there early to hear the orchestra warm up, you know, the orchestra do their warm up right before the curtain goes up and the lights going down the whole the whole experience was just everything. And so that was when I was like, I want to do that, please. How full circle that then you did Finding Neverland. I know. <laughs> I know. And I would, I would cry watching parts of Finding Neverland. Like I'd be off stage because my character was not part of the cool, was not part of the, like the cool bunch. Right. <laughs> I, was, I was a mean character, but um, I loved standing off stage and like watching them do the like Peter Pan stuff um, near the end of the show and I would just like cry because it was just so beautiful and it was like I just loved that world and it reminded me of when I was young and all of that so yeah that was cool. Peter Pan was also the first musical that I saw so I think it has that it has that even though it's not done well it's done a lot on like a community level I think but um not on you know Broadway and in New York and I think it's just it's such an amazing awe-inspiring show but it is interesting that it's not it's not done a lot like in the big the big Broadway but there's so many pieces of theater that are inspired by it and there's I feel like there's actually a few Peter Pan inspired shows that are in like the developmental stage happening all right now in various always places. I think in the yeah. same way that there's like a, they say like an Oklahoma production happening every mm-hmm. like 30 seconds or something probably not in the pandemic but pre-pandemic yeah yeah like, there's like some version of Peter Pan being developed at, at any yeah. moment which is yeah. cool it's it's a story that people return to so you do theater, I assume you did a lot of it in high school and stuff when you were you were not in school and then you went to college for it. And then I know around like two years later is when you made your Alphaba debut. What was what was what were those interim years like? Did you move to New York before mm-hmm. going back to LA for Wicked? And and what was sort of the the rise and grind like for you? Yeah, totally. Um Yes, yeah, so I was at UC Irvine and we had a program at UC. It was one of the reasons why I was really excited to go to UC Irvine. Um, I remember when I was applying to colleges, I had the application to NYU because I knew I wanted to. I'd been to New York on a trip once with my mom and I was like, this city is amazing. Oh my God, Broadway. Um, so I was like, I want to go there. That's my dream. And I was like, I'm gonna go to NYU. And I got the application, but I didn't even fill it out because I got really, really nervous. And the idea of actually moving across the country was just too scary. So I was like, I'll just stay in California. Um, But UC Irvine had a program called the New York Satellite Program where one of the semesters we would go to New York for like, I don't even know, like four or five weeks maybe and stay here and, take classes and do they you know master classes and we had to go to dance classes and had to go to auditions and all of that and I did it twice and I just it helped me sort of get a sense of New York and really gave me the confidence I was like I could I I can move here I can move here and actually try to do this whole Broadway thing or just actor thing but yeah so moved to New York after I graduated um I got my first job was through some family friends who I was an usher at the Little Schubert Theater on 42nd Street, um, part of the sort of like theater row. Um, And the the show that was there was a Stephen Schwartz musical called Captain Louie. Um, Never heard of it since, but I was an usher, but I got to be an usher and I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. I get to watch the thing. And the, the house manager of of the Little Schubert Theater had his own theater company called Godlight Theater Company, which is still around. And I remember they they did a lot of interesting, cool like developments of of novels and stuff. Like I think they did a Clockwork Orange at some point in like 1984 or maybe Brave New World. Anyways, they were doing a thing of Fahrenheit 451, turning it into a stage play. And he, a few of the other ushers were part of his theater company and 
and everybody was very cool and really nice and he was like hey do you want to like come and do like read through this play like we're figuring out and I was like yes please yes 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 um and I was reading the character of Clarice they ended up doing a production of it at 59 East, 59 theaters and like the tiny tiny theater and so like my first time performing in New York, I was doing a play, like an off-Broadway play. I felt very, very cool, very New York actor. And from that, um, a, you know, some people came to see it and a director who was doing a show, at, who was doing a production of Pippin at Goodspeed Opera House came to see the show because he was friends with somebody in the cast. And he was like, hey, do you sing? And I was like, uh-huh, I think. And he's like, you should come and audition for this play, for Pippin and I said sure um I auditioned and I got the part of um Catherine and not and too I remember shabby. not too shabby um and I remember sorry this is such a long story I just I, it's fun um it's just funny because it was like I had no idea what I was doing but I was trying so hard to pretend that I knew what I was doing and being and it was also very much being in the right place at the right time and a lot of the just luck of things that sort of happened. And I apparently enough, I was ready enough um, to like step up to these, these challenges. Um, but the Fahrenheit 451 was going to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in Scotland. And I was like, this is a freaking dream. And so we were all gonna go. And I remember I was audit auditioned for Pippin and if I got the Pippin, I couldn't do the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And I was like, well, how do I pick? I don't know what to do, da, 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 da. And I was on the phone with the casting director because I had no agent because I was 23 or tw I don't even know. I've been in the city for maybe like a year, not even a full year. And I was like, I'm committed to this show. I have to go to Scotland to do the show there. And he's like, no. Um, because the Pippin show, Pippin pays you, you will get your equity card. It's not only at Goodspeed Opera House, but then it's going on a tour. And Stephen Schwartz really was trying to get Pippin back so it could be like a revival. And this was one of the first sort of versions that they were really focusing on to try to make it into a thing. Uh, so I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess you're right. So then I went and did Pippin and I got my equity card. And we went on tour, it was my first time touring and it was such a wonderful show. I loved Pippin so much. I learned how to do some aerial silk work because they did aerial silk stuff because there was a circus theme. I got my agents from that because they came and saw it and I'm still with those agents and all of that. And like sort of got on Steven Schwartz radar and Steven Aremis who's a big music director who like did, you know, he's basically everything. He's like the music supervisor of everything big and like contemporary pop musical theater. He was our music supervisor for that. So it was just, I got, I like got in on, I was like, oh, now people kind of know who I am. Somewhere after Pippin was done. I remember my first wicked audition I ever had was for Nessa Rose and a company somewhere. And that didn't work out, which was fine. <laughs> and then I did like, oh, and then I was back at Goodspeed doing 1776. And I was going back and forth to the city auditioning for Wicked. And there were two Elphaba, there was an Elphaba like cover opening up and then an Elphaba standby for LA. And I ended up booking the Elphaba standby in LA. And I had to leave 1776 two weeks early for the run of their run. And then went back to California to then learn Elphaba. And I was Eden Espinoza and Megan Hilty were the two main witches. Casey Levy had been Eden's standby. So Casey was gonna take over for Eden. And then I was gonna become the standby for Casey. And then Casey left the show, like she did her run. And when she left her, the show, they asked me to take over and I took over. And then at the end of my run in LA doing the show, they asked me if I would open the San Francisco company of Wicked. And I said, hell yes, because it's San Francisco. It felt like close to home. I love San Francisco and I could open a show. So yeah, so that was my long, long story to Wicked. No, that's what <laughs> we want. It sounds like it's so interesting because it sounds like Steven Schwartz was like in your, um, what's the word, in your crevasse for a long time. Yeah, really was. Like it's, it's very interesting. Another show that I did a few years later that 
it was one of my favorite shows I've done. It's very close to my heart. It's this very strange avant-garde musical called The Blue Flower. And we did it at ART and then we did it at Second Stage in New York. Um, and Stephen Schwartz was the producer of it. There you go. And when I was doing The Blue Flower at ART in Boston was when Wicked asked me if I would play Alphabet on Broadway. <laughs> so incredible i have yeah. some questions related to wicked we'll have like a yeah. little bit of a wicked discussion but the first you were talking about you know Stephen Aramis, pop rock broadway sort of and so first of all i'm curious were you always more drawn stylistically to the sort of pop contemporary sound or was that sort of an accident how did that happen oh no i really was because i i along with my love of musical theater i also loved rock like I was like I was I was a teenager in the 90s so I was like grunge punk metal goth like I <laughs> yeah I was all of those things so I remember the first time I heard Rent was the first time that I had any example of like oh my god contemporary rock music meets musical theater and I was like oh my god I can I can do this thing that I love, I can do both because I really wanted to be in a rock band <laughs> um, or I want to be on Broadway, so. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. I feel like for people who love rock, especially from that sort of like 90s grunge time who also love theater, it seemed like before a certain time you kind of had to choose and differentiate yourself. This is my like rock side and this is my Broadway side and now they seem to be sort of one and the same yeah and there were so many versions of that I mean you know like Andrew Lloyd Webber would never True. have been the huge success he is without people embracing those worlds and even Stephen Schwartz it will yeah because you know he brought us sort of brought like the folk pop yeah like kind of folky sort of sound into legit musical theater but I also really loved um, like, like the American, like standard songbook. Like I like loved Harold Arlen. Like, I mean, give me some like jazzy, like bluesy torch songs and all of that. I, I loved that as well. So it, it was, it was just another little layer. I mean, and uh, when it came to musicals, I loved like dark musicals and anything that had some like dark undertones to it. I was yeah, all about thing. I was looking at your resume and it stood out to me that you had played Julie Jordan and Carousel. Um, <laughs> to go from like Alphaba to Julie Jordan seems insane stylistically, but now that you're saying that you're drawn to dark stuff, it makes total sense. Yeah, I know. I know. It's it's wild. I I, I know. It's it was really fun because I also I remember in college, I had a professor that at one point was like, Teal, you have to, you literally, like, you need to focus on if you want to be, do you want to be a rock star? Like, do you want to be in a rock band or do you want to do musical theater? Do you want to do theater? Like you have to decide one or the other. And so then I started focusing more, at least in my work and in my studies on more legit musical theater and, um, that linked me into like, like Harold Arlen's, like more of his more sort of like sorry musical, like legit sort of stuff. I just love Harold Arlen. He's like my favorite American um, composer of that age. So anyways, I talk about him a lot. Um, but like his um, like House of Flowers album or uh, that musical sort of was of like, oh, sort of a little like jumping point into then like digging into like the Rodgers and Hammerstein and like Rodgers and Hart and all of that sort of stuff. So then I got to have a big appreciation of traditional musical theater and what those are in like the history of theater and how significant they are and also how brilliant and beautifully written they are. Mm -hmm. um, and getting to do Carousel was just so much fun because it was so, <laughs> after belting my face off for, you know, like almost three years, um, it was so nice to seeing these like long, beautiful, luxurious lines and and challenging, but in, in a different way that once you sort of got it in your body, it was, it was pretty easy to do. And it was so nice to like live in a traditional musical and really appreciate what that is. Um, and now I wanna do another traditional musical. I don't know what. 
I was going to ask, I was going to say like, what's, what's the next golden age? I think people would love to see a Teal Wicks headline. Uh, age musical. My Fair Lady, that would be amazing. Cause what female performer does not want to try to play Eliza? Doesn't even have to be female, it could be anybody, but who doesn't want to play yeah. Eliza? That's so fun. Um, Brigadoon, because that music is glorious. And glorious. to be in a show with like bagpipes um, and that dancing, that would be amazing. And you can um, rock your uh, your ancestral red hair. Yes, yes. And who doesn't love trying to do like a Scottish brogue? So that'd be fun as well. You mentioned belting your face off for three years. So, I, and I, I'm sure you get this question all the time, but the, the first question that comes to my mind when I want to speak to an alphabet is like, stamina wise, how do you do that eight shows a week for as long as you did it on and off for three years? Yeah, it was, it was not easy. Um, I know some of my friends who are alphabets, they, they actually, some of them are, were able to manage it and were like, yeah, yeah, I figured it out. And there are some of us who also didn't. I, because when I, when I got the alphabet standby part and then I took over as alphabet, like only a couple months later, it was the first time I had ever carried a show. I had ever done any role demanding as that because there's not that many roles that are as demanding as alphabet. Um, and I was very blessed with like these strong cords and belting was not super difficult for me. Um, Cause I guess when I was a teenager at all my concerts screaming along to my favorite rock bands, I figured out those muscles. Um, but I, I didn't really have a lot of discipline. I didn't really, I had technique, but it was sort of just more of, of like luck just like will and luck and a little bit of like, yeah, we have to warm up a little bit and like do a few of these things. Um, but I also was very, my focus for Elphaba was more like acting, telling the story and all of that. Um, so like vocal stylings was not my first thing that I was interested in. There are some, there are some women who are like brilliant vocal technicians who can do like these amazing like fills and riffs and all of that sort of stuff and that that sort of was not my main focus but so anyways with all of that I made a lot of mistakes and I kind of during my San Francisco run I got sick at the beginning of it and basically had a lot of vocal issues throughout my whole run of San Francisco and my year of doing the show in San Francisco was basically trying to figure out how to just like get through the show and stay healthy. And I had to go on vocal rest when I wasn't in the show. I like, my social life was very, very low. Like it was, it was very interesting and very eye opening to be like, this is what it means to do a role like this, to be a professional yeah. actor and to do this. And then, so then by the time I was opening, I was making my Broadway debut as Alphaba. Mm -hmm. I'd been through on like a roller coaster already with the role. Um, I had a year away from the role, did other things. Julie Jordan was one of them. <laughs> and, and the Blue Flower was another one, which was like my artistic creative like outlet. Um, so I was able to come into the Broadway company just wiser, also knowing all my mistakes and all the things that uh, I had to be very aware of and give myself permission to like take shows off and like if you like do a full week of shows you can totally take off like a show the next week like do we have to do to stay healthy and I actually got sort of survived like I knew the balance I knew when I had to be live like a nun and go home and sleep you know as much as I could the next day and then when I could also do things that were fun to like fill that life joy well as well yeah I don't know I, it's She's tricky. <laughs> yeah, my sense from like, I, I think I mentioned that I was like at the perfect age from when Wicked first came out. I think I was nine or 10 when it came out. And so obviously I have a storied history of watching various Wicked interviews and different alphabets and things. An irony about it that has always struck me is that like it's often, it's such an amazing show because it's often a Broadway debut for people. It's it's such an amazing door and gateway for, for young performers, but also can be super isolating, especially in the role of Alphabet, Alphaba because it's so demanding. And I think that can be 
the 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 balance between the high high of like headlining and carrying as you say a Broadway show on your shoulders but then like going back to your apartment and like sleeping most of the day and not seeing anyone is yeah pretty stark and also just the way that the show is laid out Elphaba is very isolated just from the rest of the cast um Mm -hmm. you know she's she doesn't come into the show until like 15 minutes 20 minutes in what maybe it's 15 minutes in everybody hates her at the beginning you know like she's not in like any big chorus group songs like dancing around with people like no it and whenever you are off stage you're basically either changing drinking water or running for your next entrance so it's it it gets the show itself can be feel very very isolating and I think that's like when I first did this when I was first doing it in in Los Angeles I wanted I'm I love people I love community I love collaboration I love all of that so I was very like let's hang out guys let's hang out like every every time there's any cast company thing I was always like yes 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 I want to be friends with everybody because everybody hates me in the show like pretending that they hate me um so when I realized I was like all right you gotta you gotta you can't do that and it doesn't mean that you're not going to be friends with the rest of the company you just have to be very cautious and very selective of like how and when you do all of that um but it is it 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 can go dark really fast for the alphabus (laughs) It's so interesting. I hadn't thought of like in the show itself that you're isolated, but that mm-hmm. knowing the show, that's so true. Speaking of the show itself, on a light, slightly lighter note, is there a favorite song or scene that as Alphaba that you like loved doing every time you did it? Oh, again, because I love the darkness. I think because I think because I have a lot of lovely light things in my life. Um, that I I like dark things because I feel like it just kind of balances you know it's like natural balance um but No Good Deed was my favorite song to sing just because it was like it's my favorite alphabet song actually oh it's amazing I mean it's so like you start like yelling you're doing a spell like you have a wind machine it's near the end of the show it's your last big like big song so you can kind of like let out anything that hasn't really been left out yet you know let loose um it's just it's like when she fully embraces all the things that she's been trying so hard to like fight against she just she like leans into the like all right you want to you want a bad you want a bad guy you want like the monster fine here you go here yeah it's like you know it's cool it's very it's Very so compelling. badass, but I do, as you say, it's the end of the show. So I do often also feel bad for the alphabets because it's like, you know, after Defying Gravity, you still got No Good Deed. Don't forget about No Good Deed. And the time from when you leave stage to when you make your entrance for No Good Deed and start singing, like you have, it's the quickest change. You're like running, running the entire time. That's why during at the Gershwin theater, um, they have a, their rehearsal room is like on some floor in that building above the theater. And they have treadmills in the rehearsal room. And they often offer like for Alpha Buzz, like it's actually really good to like practice running on the treadmill and like singing No Good Deed because that's basically what you're doing in the show. Wow, I love that little behind the scenes. That is- yeah. That is some hardcore stuff. Yeah, I know. So then you did these two Broadway shows, uh, the revival of Jekyll and Hyde, and then you did Finding Neverland, which was new. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, neither of which I saw, sadly enough. Well, Jekyll and Hyde was around for like a month, maybe, <laughs> on the Broadway. Yeah. Which is funny because we did a, a like a six month tour. Um, which was the last time that I did a tour and you know I love traveling so it was really fun to do that um <clears throat> but it was just so funny that like we did this giant tour and then we were coming to Broadway and then we were there for like a minute and then we're like okay bye <laughs> yeah I was going to ask a very frank question I think it's it's interesting because you came off of your first Broadway show is Wicked which was sort of tried and true no way Wicked was gonna quote unquote fail um, going into these iconic roles. And then you did these two Broadway shows that weren't as big commercial successes. And 
I've always found it interesting, an interesting question. Do you think there's like a secret sauce or formula to that? Like where you, did you have any impressions of like, oh, this is like, I don't know if Broadway audiences are going to love this as much as they think it's going to be, or were you so like in it? I often find when I'm involved in a show that I'm so like in it that I can't really see what people are going to think. What, what, what's your take? Yeah. On I think, I think it depends on, I think it very much depends on the show and also depends on like the role that you are in the show, mm-hmm. whether you're, you know, like yeah. on the creative side or if you're like, you know, playing a role in the show, like who this person is. Um, yeah, like Jekyll and Hyde was interesting just because it was like, because it's Frank Wildhorn and I adore Frank. And actually one of my favorite musicals when I was young when I saw it come through uh, with Scarlet Pimpernel, and I I love that show. I love that score. I I and when I met him, I was like, Frank Scarlet Pimpernel is one of my favorite musicals. And yeah, so like yeah, I love it. He was like, okay, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was it was just interesting because like we had Constantine, and then we had Deborah Cox, and it was like these different worlds coming together and. It, I, that show I wasn't sure I honestly had no idea and it also was my only other experience being in a show that like a Broadway show was Wicked and we all know Wicked's successful and you know it, I wasn't we weren't doing the whole like creating it creating yeah. what these are and I was trying to take a role that that existed a character who existed and like bring my version of it and also try to like Emma is even Frank and um, and uh, uh, they all know that she's kind of underwritten. So we're like, how do we like try to flesh her out more, make it yeah. all these sort of things. Um, but it was just, it, it, and there's so many elements. It was just the first time that I had been in a show because other than that, I had done regional theater shows and those are shows that existed and everybody knows they picked those shows because they know their audience wants to see them and their right. work and being in a production and there's, you know, the big budget and like, all these sort of things and like when we were moved when we were going to Broadway our costume designer was like don't worry you're getting another dress for the Broadway production like you know like all these sort of things that you're just like oh okay I don't know which that was it like a lot of conversations like oh this is going to be like better or different for Broadway a little bit like they're yeah a little bit and it's also interesting because traveling the country like there are certain spots in the U.S. the audience is incredibly different from the New York audience and there were some places where the show was a huge hit because Frank Wildhorn has a big fan base um there's also Jekyll and Hyde has a totally. fan base they're called the Jekies and they would show up they'd be there is and that like, true the Jekies yeah Jekies yeah yeah wow mm-hmm. I had no idea yeah I got, I got like a pin somewhere that they gave me um and it was so it was just really interesting. And then when we come to New York and poor Frank, like New York, the New York theater scene does not give him a lot of like leeway. They like are so excited to like tear his shows apart. Um, and sometimes it, sometimes you're like, yeah, like it could have been better. But then there's other times you're like, you guys, this is actually good. Like, come on, like yeah. cut some slack. Luckily, because Constantine and Deborah were the big big stars and like they were doing all the press stuff I I mean I I was definitely trying to be like hey I'm here too like I'm doing stuff I'm doing impressive stuff like what look what I can do but also I was not going to make or break the show so like I didn't really worry about that Yeah. yeah and Finding Neverland was was the same also a role that I feel my role Mary Berry was they weren't they were trying to figure out who she was and there was a lot of tweaking of my character as they were trying to open the show on Broadway but I was a minor I was one of the you know supporting leads so it didn't really I was not going to make or break the show of the opening number changed three times within three days like it was completely cut at one point then we had a brand new song the next day and just all of that and then I mean and then, you know, there's just, then there's, there's also the whole Harvey, like, layer that I, I had no... What year was Finding Neverland again? 2015. Okay. It was like, yeah, it's the, the more I've been 
as like all of the stuff with like Harvey has like come out and all of that, there was a lot of stuff that was happening, I think, on the down low with him while our show was trying to open on Broadway. Um, I never, I never knew anything that was going on, like, like, so clueless. I don't think it was very present. I don't think it was really brought into like our world as we were putting the show on, but like, just, he's just a big, he's just, he's a, he's, he's a big guy. Like he's, you know, like big presence, yeah, kind of a bully, like kind of was sometimes there, sometimes not. It was just, it was sort of this, you know, big shadow that was sort of around that we just made, it just made like, it just made everything just a little extra weird and made things seem more complicated than I think they could, they really needed to be for the show, which sucks because I think the show is actually really lovely. And yeah. like, there's some beautiful, absolutely wonderful moments throughout of it, throughout the show. And it's just, I think on its journey from like, because they also did it at ART before it came to Broadway. And I think on the journey from ART to Broadway, trying to figure out how to make it a Broadway hit, they made some choices that took away some of like the fun, fantasy, playful elements of the show. Finding Neverland was one where I was like, is this going to be a big, like, is this going to be a success or is it not going to be a success? I don't know. I really can't tell. I would like for it to be a success because, you know, I want to, I want a nice, like long Broadway job and a yeah. nice steady paycheck. Yeah. And I loved that company. Like it was such an amazing company of people. I loved going to work with those people every day. We had a really, really wonderful time. It's so interesting yeah. because it does seem like, you know, a, a producer like Harvey pre the fall would seem to make things easier, but it sounds like it made things harder for many different yeah. reasons but um yeah it's so interesting but because usually we would think like oh if Hollywood's involved big Hollywood then Broadway will be easy but in this case yeah. I think it sounds like it made things more complicated and doing a new Broadway musical is already complicated enough yeah absolutely we should talk about the share show I saw it I loved it I had the time of my life I thought you were incredible first of all fully pop rock music yeah. Yeah. fully going there um first of all I want to ask just quickly did you get to meet Cher yes oh yes spent and definitely spent time like? with Cher Cher she she honestly is kind of everything that you expect her to be in person like she's she, it's it's just it's it's wild. She literally, when she enters the room, the temperature changes. She's kind of like a planet, like everything just sort of like the gravitational pull just kind of like goes towards her. She's also like, she's in her seventies. So she, uh, th there's always been a casualness to share, but like the casualness that is part of her like draw and essence is not like a laza fair sort of thing. It's not like a uh, at like um, ambivalence or anything like that. It's just that she she has been famous for so long and has worked her ass off for so long and has in a way, like when she, she's taken big risks and most of the time when she's taken these big risks doing things that she didn't know if she could do or not, she succeeded. So she just has this sort of like confident, just like ease kind of casualness that sort of like kind of she just walks through life it was interesting meeting her and I was like our journey met her for the first time we were doing the show in Chicago um the first time we met her she had like this like she always looks she always looks amazing like just like casually fierce like she had this like awesome hat on and these like huge glasses and this like just really cool like leather jacket um, and then the next time we met her, the sunglasses were off, but she still had like a hat and like full on like face. Um, and then the next time, like, it was like the hat was gone. Her hair was like less done, like less makeup. Like it, like each time we would, as she came around more to help sort of talk to us, cause she really wanted to talk to the shares every time it, it was like, she sort of would like take one little piece of armor and be like, okay, I'm, I'm opening myself a little bit more up to you and all of that. Uh, but it was very, it was very amazing to have those experiences to then play her because it just made, 
just made, I don't know, it's just so many things about who she is and the enigma that she is. It made sense. You're like, okay, yeah. Like she's fragile, but also like super duper, like strong and like steeled. Yeah. It's yeah. So she's great. not as tall as you think. That's, that's the one thing. Really? She's like, yeah. Everybody thinks she's like almost six feet tall. She's like five, six. She's like wow. my height. I love that. <laughs> Probably because she's always in like sky high heels and who wouldn't be oh, yeah. care. And like, like headdresses, of course. Headdresses. Well, the costumes, I mean, that you got to wear those Bob Mackie oh. costumes. And I remember specifically your share, in my opinion, got the best costumes in just my personal opinion. Do you? <laughs> I had, I agree. I had some best <laughs> costumes. I also like, I played her, like, the time period that I played her was just some of the best. It was like 1970s. It's just, is that was iconic fashion to begin with. And that was sort of when her and Bob really became like this yeah. powerhouse fashion duo. And like, they went great. Like he tried all these different things on her and she was willing to wear them. Yeah. She, she had that confidence. And there was also like wearing those, his clothing sort of almost like helped her play this character of being this like fierce strong sassy woman you know like clothing really became a tool and um almost like a weapon for her (laughs) yeah it's interesting because I think in theater obviously clothing is always a costume a tool that an actor has to get you into character and it seems like Cher in real life used that um Mm -hmm. she's so theatrical and I think that's one of the reasons I thought that the Cher show was one of the more successful uh, bio musicals that I've yeah. seen. And I and I say successful, meaning like the story made sense and I like felt that I understood who Cher was. Um, but I do wanna ask you too, the, the three, for those who are unfamiliar, three different actors played Cher at the different, different points in Cher's life, which definitely has become sort of in vogue uh, on Broadway when we're doing bio musicals. Um, but I'm curious, it's such a unique concept. Um, how did you guys approach that? How did you make the different ones different and unique yet feel like they were still the same person? Yeah, that was that was one of the most exciting things about doing the Cher show was figuring that out. And with my fellow wonderful Cher actresses, uh, Michaela Diamond, who is our young babe, and then superstar Stephanie J. Block, who was our star. And then also D. Rossioli, who was the standby for my character Lady and Stephanie's uh, character star. And D in all of our like Cher rehearsals, D was always there. So like we would refer to the shares, the four shares rather than just the three shares. Oh, great. <clears throat> yeah. What I think what made our, what made it really interesting for us was that we weren't just doing a, you know, like passing the torch sort of storytelling, like this is babe section. Now this is lady section. Now this is star section. Like it became all the versions talking to one another, trying to shed light and trying to encourage and to look back and like try to figure out maybe what went wrong or like, don't worry, you got this girl, like go ahead and like take these risks and all of that having those moments in the show just made it feel extra extra special and made it feel like yes we were playing the same person but it was basically like with even though we're playing the same person we have to be believably the same person we were three different people three different actresses playing telling a story of somebody at through three very different times of their life. And also because of Cher, just who she is, like it makes sense that it could be three different people because she never, she hates when people say like reinvent, like she reinvents herself. She hates when people say that, but she just, she is able to step into other versions of herself. And I think a lot of us, especially in the theater world and actors and performers, we understand what that is. Like, you know, like when I think about myself at 12 years old, she's 12 year old Teal is very, very different from like 21 year old Teal. And 21 year old Teal is super different from 38 year old Teal. Like very, very different headspaces, very, very different 
dreams and wants and desires and, and ways of going through life. So that sort of took the pressure off of trying to be be the same person because we're like, we're three different actresses. We're going to be different. She's very, very different at these times in her life. And the basic through line is what is the story? What are the essential bits of her soul and her spirit? What is important to this specific story, the way that we're telling it? How do we land on those things? And then try to s squeeze in a few extra like physical physicality and voice things mm -hmm. that we will lock in like certain words and certain phrases we would really try to make sure that we were lined up on those so that we sounded the same and a few like physicality things like we would all do the same thing at certain points like I remember I remember we were on the on the tonight show which was very exciting with Cher oh my um, god <laughs> and when we when the three of us when Michaela Steph and I came on to like go sit on the couch we sat down and crossed our legs at the exact same time which was just weird like we had just started like syncing up in very in very unaware ways but and I also think like as you say much as she hates the phrase reinventing mm -hmm. herself it's not the story of a person who just like aged like it's not as the concept is not just like we need different actresses who are different ages to showcase yeah. this person at different ages it's more like this phase of Cher's life was about this thing and then it became yeah. about this thing and then it became about this thing which is more story oriented as you yeah. said and it's interesting hearing you talk it seems to me that and I know this from having worked with you briefly I think of you as like an a, a musical theater actor like you definitely come at it from like an acting story level is that of the three is that what you return to the most but you're also of course a superstar singer but at the end of the day is like what what is your heart telling you that you love the most at the end of the day oh yeah acting acting yeah yeah, yeah. I think that's why I was drawn to you know theater like being yeah. able to tell tell stories to really like tell a story and and to tell it over and over and over again but still like in every but every time it's somehow different because you're discovering new things every single time and really trying to like dig into people and characters and what's at the heart and I think you can see it in your career which is the best thing to see obviously your first love is theater are there any genres that you want to do more of as you're looking forward in your career I I would love to do more straight theater because as much as I love singing, I do. Um, getting to do a play where you don't have to, there's just a lot of like extra things you have to be aware of when you have to sing. Um, even like if it's a super emotional show, trying to sing like after you've been crying is some people are good at that. I am terrible at it. So like just being able to let go of those things to be like, I can be a snotty mess and not have to worry about singing these pretty notes because I don't have any notes to sing. I can just like stick to just my words, moving it along and all of that. Um, yeah, I definitely would love to do that. I, I mean, I have my bucket list, you know, dream actor is like to do like a handful of Tennessee Williams plays because who doesn't want to play some of his characters. Um, uh, and then I, I haven't, I would love to try to do film. I'm just so intrigued by that, what that is. And, and TV is fun and TV is its own thing. And I mean, I would love TV film because it's much more lucrative than theater, um, just financially and whatnot. Um, Out on this show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh. Um, but yeah, it would be really fun to see what it's like to like do a proper film, like what, like, Part of me thinks it would be like doing a run of a show in a way more than like television. Yeah. So I, I, I want to do that. And I keep on thinking, I'll be like, I'll be like in like some cool indie films, like, like a, um, yeah. Like I want to be like in a Coen Brothers film. Well, you're from Sacramento. Maybe Greta Gerwig will put you in a, in a film. I actually dream of being in a Greta Gerwig film. I am obsessed with her so much. Me too. Me too. So much. Like Francis Ha. Anyway, 
I, one of my favorite movies. I'm, yeah, mine too. Do you think Frances Ha would work on stage? Do you think it could be adapted to the stage? I think it could be because of the modern dance element because she's yeah. supposed to be a dancer. And I think that could be really exciting. Uh, yeah. I definitely think there are things about some specific things about it that are like special on film mostly. So yeah. you have to like rework a lot of stuff. That's so interesting. I never thought about that. Yeah. Maybe we should I do know. it. I wonder if we'd get yeah. her uh, permission. I know. She likes theater, right? Right? She comes, I think, I mean, I mean, if you saw a lady, she comes from theater. Like she, yeah. she's, she's a musical theater geek at the end of the day. Yeah. My last segment is called the thank you five segment and it's just five rapid fire questions. So answer first thing that comes to the top of your head. Um, firstly, your craziest wicked story. Oh, craziest wicked story. Um, uh, it was a toss, toss, toss episode. It, at post popular, it was toss, yeah. toss. Um, Alphaba like enters into the classroom and Fierro's there and they have like a little mini encounter where he's like, what? Um, and I tossed, tossed really hard. I was, it was when I was still new, I think I was still maybe, it was maybe right when I had just taken over in LA. So I was still really very like, I I can do this, you guys, I can do this. Um, and I literally tossed, tossed my feet out from underneath me and fell on my butt. It was very, very weird. Cause wow. I was like, how did I end up on the ground? And the Fiero just started laughing at me. And, <laughs> and because I was not at a place where I felt like I could properly just laugh and go with it, which now I would do. I was like, this wasn't supposed to happen. Stop laughing at me. <laughs> I was like genuinely upset with him for laughing at me. <laughs> yeah. Funny. I feel like now you would definitely make a meal out of that. On oh yeah. I totally would. Your favorite, uh, Bob Mackie share costume that you got to wear at the share show. Ooh. Um, um, God, there were so many. Um, okay, my favorite was during the big Mackie, the ain't nobody's business. If I do, like we call it the Mackie parade, I'm changing on stage, literally like dropping total trowel, like center stage behind a little screen. And I put on these feather cowboy chaps and like a little like top that has like a badge on it like I'm a sheriff in this like giant bedazzled oh, cowboy hat that. yeah I just love it because it's so over the top and it's so Bob Mackie and it when we were doing the fittings and he was trying to figure out what that costume was he was like oh these are these are these are just some things that were in a fashion show I did a while I think I'm gonna use them in the show and just you know put them on me and I was like this is like yeah I'm literally wearing Bob Mackie that has been in a fashion show, like walking down the runway. That was How cool. cool. Oh. Yeah. And it was so stressful to get that quick change going down that the fact that we did it, I was like, I own, I was like, oh, we did it. I feel like There's you of all people and certainly of all my guests between Alphaba and Cher Show are a, a boss quick changer. Yes, it is all about the dressers. Your dressers will literally make or break your show. They are angels in the theater world. A good dresser can make your show so amazing. And our dressers, all, all the dressers, they're just amazing. And my dressers in the share show were like, oh God, they were pros, like on top of it. They're like, you just stand there and we'll make it happen. And I was like, okay. Well, you needed it. You needed it. Um, yeah. Next something underrated in your opinion about either Jacqueline Hyde or Finding Neverland? Ooh, underrated, underrated. Um, I think uh, Finding Neverland, the music, the musical inspiration, if you go and listen to it, even they have like a pop album with all these, you know, pop people singing versions of the songs. It's such a wide range of styles there's like very specific like beetle inspired tunes and it honestly when I was listening to it it reminds me of like like one of like a wild beetles album that like has everything from like beautiful pop ballads to like quirky funky weird songs uh, the the music in that show is I think very underrated and I think it's very very clever and it was very intentional after you know talking to the writers how they created that so everyone go listen. I actually have never listened. So maybe I'll do, that'll be my homework. Um, 
Next, uh, I assume you probably are now at a point in your career where you, when you audition, you just sing the material that they give you. But back in the day, did you have a go-to pop rock audition song? Oh, yeah. For a while, it was um, Hearts uh, Magic Man. Oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. And now my like, because it's kind of my gospel folk sort of is um, Patty Griffin's Up to the Mountain. That's like any audition. If I can sing that song, I will sing that song because it's one of my favorite songs oh, in the whole I world. I want to hear you sing it. Do it at a concert soon. I'd love to hear it. And lastly, <laughs> my last question, do you have a dream role? And if so, what is it? Oh my gosh, a dream role. Oh, so many. Um, uh, Blanche, Blanche Dubois and Streetcar Named Desire. That's, that's my like dream goal. I, I want to do that before I'm dead. It's so good, it's so good. <laughs> Which is sad is that I'm actually of the proper age to play Blanche, but nobody plays Blanche at my age anymore. But like when it was written, she's my age. So in theory, I could play her right now. Well, times have changed significantly since yeah. then. So I think people would definitely, which is good. People would definitely be like shocked if you were playing yeah. Dubois right now. They'd be like too young. Too Thank young. you. Thank you, everyone. Well, this has been such a pleasure, Teal. Is there anything I've missed? Any subjects? I didn't cover yeah. anything. Plug. Oh, no, no. I got, I got nothing. I just, this is super fun. Oh, Thank it was the you. best. You were such a great interview. I loved chatting more and hearing all these stories. It's just my favorite thing. I'm sorry for all these like Hi. loud cars going by. That's okay. That happens. It's me. It's New I'm York. not even in New York, but we're on. You're not even in New York. So. You're on a road. I was, yeah. but you know. <laughs> oh, for the viewers watching, I should have mentioned this at the top. My background looks different. I've never done it before, not in my house. So I'm at my parents' house, and that's why you see sort of random Soviet <laughs> Soviet era propaganda art in the background. <laughs> I love that. Shaken, and there's conspiracy theories about my politics online. Well. Thank you so much, Teal. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for watching Call Time listeners. As always, it's the highlight of my week doing these and chatting with you guys and connecting with a theater-loving audience. We'll be back next week, uh, same time, same place with another amazing guest. Thanks for watching.